Hi, uh, my name is Sandy Bear, and this is our first session of the new year, the new academic year of the Vermont Institute of International and Community Involvement, or VICI. And we are going to begin the session with talking about part of the Constitution on the Second Amendment of the Right to Bear Arms, a very controversial subject. Uh, uh, an amendment that's been in controversy since the beginning of our republic, when this amendment was adopted as the second amendment out of the historic process that was known as the American Revolution, when militias and individuals bore arms to defeat the British Empire in the first anti-colonial revolution in history, and the first successful revolution which created a republic in the new world or in the Americas. And with us tonight to discuss both the controversial parts of the Second Amendment and also the historic context of, this, of the Second Amendment is Jared Carter, who is a constitutional scholar, a professor at Mount Law School. He headed up the First Amendment clinic at Cornell a year ago, and he does commentaries right now, right, on uh, our local radio station. Is that right? Radio, TV, I'll do, I'll do anything. You'll do it, I know that. I love talking about this stuff. Yes, I know. Okay, so Jared's going to set the stage by talking about the Second Amendment in its legal and historic con context, and also the present cases. He's also probably going to give us his interpretation of the Second Amendment, and we welcome participation if what wants to argue and bring forth their views, that would be also great. All right, so Jared, take it away. Yeah, great, uh, Sandy, thanks. and. and Welcome folks tuning in uh, out there in the Zoomverse. Uh, really happy to be here and part participate in the, the uh, I guess the first, of, 50 first time this, this year, yeah. of, of the year um, lecture discussion. I really would like this to be as much of a discussion as we can have. Um, so my thinking is to sort of lay out a lot of what Sandy talked about um, and then hopefully open it up for, for conversation and, and questions. Um, that we'll try to answer and, and, and share our thoughts and ideas about. So uh, I do want to first and just acknowledge that Sandy pointed out, I'm a First Amendment person. That's what I do. That's what uh, I, I think my constitutional expertise is in. Uh, so when Sandy and, and Vicki invited me to come here and talk about the Second Amendment, uh, I was really excited because it gave me an opportunity to sort of delve into a, a different area of of the law. And while the First Amendment is first for a reason, in my view, uh, the second, second Amendment, in many respects, is equally important and perhaps equally controversial in, in a lot of ways. Um, what I think is really important to do when you start talking about a constitutional right and, and what it means and how it should apply is you really got to go to the words on the paper uh, at the outset. And the Second Amendment, as folks might know, is pretty darn short. And you might say, well, how does such a short amendment uh, become such a controversial topic? Uh, and these are difficult issues uh, to wrestle with as, as a society, no doubt. And people are very passionate on both sides of, of this argument. But here's what the Second Amendment actually says. And we'll start there and then walk through some of the cases and what they say and how that history that Sandy alluded to comes in uh, to that, that conversation. So the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So in a lot of ways, and this will come back to, to the discussion here in a few moments, uh, the Second Amendment is, is not a model of uh, uh, English language writing. There's a lot of interjected clauses and commas, and as it turns out, those commas had a huge impact in many respects in how the court interpreted it. But it's short, and the first clause, a well-regulated militia. And what the courts have said on that front is they've looked back at history, starting with, in fact, before the revolution, um, and said that really the foundation of the, the United States as the country as we, we understand it came out of that revolution and militias were a huge part of that, that process, right? There was not, in fact, there was a, a big, that was antithetical in a lot of ways to have a standing army for many years in the United States. Isn't there any against standing armies 
right? Exactly, significant limits uh, during times of times of peace. And so the militia were the way that the the, the war, at least initially, was fought. Uh, and so the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the Second Amendment through that historic lens. Uh, and I'm sure there's folks, and we can talk more about this later, that agree or disagree with the way that it's done, but that's how the courts looked at it, through the lens of the militia and through the lens of what the revolution and the militia were about, which was at the time to defend the fledgling United States. Wait a minute, to fight against the English Empire. To fight against the English right. Empire, right. right. Exactly, to independence. Right. Um, and so the, the most, I guess, important case that really gets at this is a case that came out of the District of Columbia called uh, D.C. v. Heller. Um, and it was a challenge to a District of Columbia law that banned handguns uh, and required that shotguns and rifles, long, long, long guns, were kept under lock and key when not in use. And the, the U.S. Supreme Court looked at that law and struck it down in large part because of that history and tradition that it's had consistently said is the basis for the second amendment um so the 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 the, the most important part of that is the court looked at that first clause a well-regulated militia and said that is not a limit on the constitution mm -hmm. because a lot of folks in the in that case said and there's still plenty of people that believe said that um the militia clause was a limit on the right. Second Amendment, right. that it was meant to, meant to be that if you weren't part of a militia, the Second Amendment didn't really protect exactly. an individual right. right. And the Supreme Court said no, because of the placement of the comma exactly. in right. the Second right. Amendment, uh, they, they said it was a prefatory clause, not a limiting fact, mm -hmm. and ultimately concluded that the, the Second Amendment enshrined an individual's right to possess arms, not an individual's right as part of a militia to possess arms. Um, and they used what we refer to as the history and tradition test to determine what sort of regulations of firearms could exist. Because Heller didn't say, you know, you can't regulate firearms, right? Um, in fact, they said, said the opposite. Uh, the, it, it stated that there's certain sensitive locations like schools and hospitals and government buildings where firearms can be regulated, um, and that reasonable regulations that are grounded in these history, this history and tradition could also be uh, grounds for regulating firearms. So it's not a, 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 a like many constitutional rights. It's not a a, a right that is um, absolute. There are there are significant exceptions, but Heller set forth that basic principle of the history and tradition, Including the militia. The militia. Yes. And included, though, the individual right to bear arms, correct? Yes. And Heller focused primarily on the individual right to bear arms for the purposes of self-defense. Exactly. Right, right, right. right. And, and, and not only self-defense, but defense of the whole. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, folks that critique that analysis, quite frankly. Um, and they, they point to history and tradition that's different. And I think that is one of the... Okay, okay so the Heller case mm -hmm. upheld them, the right of militias to bear arms. And by the way, the individuals, right? individuals to bear arms. Right? Yeah, and I think that because, remember, there was no standing army. In order for the militia to have okay, so arms, people had to have... Right. Well, how does the militia differ from a standing army, which is also prohibited in the U.S. Constitution, is to have you're not supposed to have standing arms, correct? Yeah, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's a constitutional piece because um, clearly we have standing armies today, uh, uh, but there was certainly a few at the time, you didn't have standing armies. and for many for, for decades there were right. no standing armies, and so. Uh, what was a militia now? Was it volunteers? Uh, the, so some were paid, some weren't. They were volunteers. They were they were essentially state and community military units that were organized and trained at more at the more local level um and they and so they didn't have but there was no draft correct okay so these were people who volunteered to be in militias and fight against what fight against the english right 
fight against private unions. Definitely. And right, okay. So, uh, but they were volunteers. They were volunteers, and these militia didn't have arms. There were no funds to to to, 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 to fund that, and so these folks were able, and I think this is where that history of tradition comes in, because of the Second Amendment, these folks had arms that they would bring to their militia service. Um, and I think that, in a lot of ways, is... Exactly. And that, that's, in a lot of ways, is where I think this debate over what is the history and tradition um, and how should we be interpreting the Second Amendment comes up. And it's, of course, a more vigorous debate now because, you know, of... of the gun violence that we see in the United States, which is very, which is a, uh, we are an outlier internationally when it comes to gun violence. So I think- I don't know if that's, is that still true? It is, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I think um, uh, homicides in the United States, and my statistics aren't gonna be exact, so I'm pulling from memory, uh, something like 70% of them are, are, are firearms. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Canada is next and it's 44%. Um, New Zealand, Australia, 10, 12 percent. So it is lower. And I, don't, I think it's I think it's undeniable that the the fact that we have a Second Amendment is why there are so many firearms in the United States. Um, now again, folks can disagree as to whether or not that's good, bad or otherwise. Uh, but I think it's a it's a big reason because that right protects the individual's ability to have right. firearms. And to defend themselves. And it's based in that idea of of self-defense, self-defense. Right. exactly. Um, the the uh, the question that was left open, though, and really haven't had a very clear answer to it. I think this is. Um, I would be surprised not to see this come up in ca- in cases in the future. Is once you step outside of the home, how much regulation can happen with respect to guns? I think the Heller case pretty clearly says you can't tell people they can't have a loaded gun in their house. Um, or that they can't have a handgun for self-defense in their house. What about when you're out walking the streets? Um, And there was a case that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court last term, I believe, uh, the New York State Gun and Rifle Club Club, Club case, uh, challenging some New York laws that regulated the use and possession of firearms, concealed firearms outside of the home. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court looked poised to strike that down, too, under the same rationale that it did tell her. Uh, but the laws were changed, and so the case was mooted. In other words, there was no longer a case for the, for the parties to bring. And so we didn't get an answer from the court yet. But I think that's sort of the next question. Um, and on the one side, uh, folks who believe in a, in a broad Second Amendment right say, well, it's, it's got to apply uh, in the streets and out in public uh, for the same self-defense reasons. Those who, who, who prefer a narrow interpretation of the Second Amendment say, well, no, it was about self-defense of, of self and home, um, and the data doesn't really support the idea that, you know, we're walking around as sitting ducks. Um, I think the Supreme Court, as it's made up now, is probably going, you know, when, these, when this case does come back up, and it will, um, is probably going to uh, interpret the Second Amendment broadly uh, to include mm-hmm. Uh, that that right in public. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting and it's an interesting set of, of circumstances. I think there's ways uh, to constitutionally deal with the Second Amendment uh, using the history and tradition tests uh, that are more effective um, in both protecting the right to bear arms while also allowing for reasonable restrictions on arms mm-hmm. in the United States, because we clearly, look, we clearly have uh, a pandemic of violence in the United States that differs from anywhere else in the world. And I don't think you can pin it, if we're going to be honest, on just the Second Amendment. No, I don't either. Um, but clearly that has to be part of the conversation. I'm on. And so I actually take some... Why is it? Why? Well, I think it, it, if you look at the, the number of firearms in the United States... Yes. Uh, I think it's 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 something like 300 million, uh, only 60 million of which I believe are actually registered. And I'll confess that six six of them are mine. Um, uh, so I am a fire. Why do you have six firearms? Well, because when I'm out hunting, you need a different type of firearm depending on the species you're pursuing. So I actually think, uh, and I'd love for people to jump into the conversation, 
I actually think that rather it makes it work a lot better. And actually, I think we protect the right more consistently with how firearms were used back then to ground it not in uh, the right to self-defense, but to ground it in the idea that a firearm at the time was an agricultural tool of hunting uh, and certainly protecting your own home. Uh, and I think that would allow us then to take sort of a First Amendment approach to the Second Amendment. And you could carve out certain types of firearms that would not be protected by the Second Amendment. Yeah, yeah. I do know that we're going to that. All right, good. So I'm glad this I finally got someone to start talking. Great. 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 So we look at the First, so we, the first Amendment. Uh, even though it says there should be no law of the freedom of speech, we carved out, three courts carved out all sorts of exceptions. I can't defame you. I can't incite riot. I can't threaten you with a true threat. Uh, I can't. What do you mean I can't, you can't defame you? That would be a civil defamation. You wouldn't go to jail. Well, no, but you, it can be prohibited. So I can, the defamation is exception, in other words, to the First Amendment. So I think you could come up with uh, a similar model for the Second Amendment and say there are certain things that would be exempted from protection while still protecting that right, uh, but, uh, but perhaps we wouldn't be able to own certain firearms uh, that have been used, that are, that are truthfully you know, used by the military. Uh, that are still and, used by the military. And, and, yeah. Right. right. They're used by citizens, and I can tell yeah. you that an AR-15 is a, is a great weapon to defend your home set, right? right? Because of the ability for you to how precise it is, and you have to have a You have a very bold person. You have a very clever argument, I will give you that. I like you that. You had me on the edge of my seat. I'm like, oh, there it is. And I like that. But yeah. you, know, you mentioned carve out earlier. Yeah. You know, spoke about such places as mm -hmm. gun free zones, mm -hmm. hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. I'm curious, my question is to both of you. Do you believe that these have actually performed their intended duty? No. Or have they backfired for me? Uh, well, I don't, I, I guess, I, I don't know that they backfired. Um, well, gun shootings at schools, right. for instance. Well, no doubt, but I, I don't. I think it's. A, I think you're talking about like correlation and causation. You can't say because there's a prohibition on bringing guns into schools, people bring guns into schools. No, no, but people used to bring guns into school mm -hmm. and um, pretty regularly. There was a much more healthy environment. Mm -hmm. guns. The prohibition of them made it more taboo. It also, you're, I, I personally believe that an unstable or a student or individual is less likely to approach a school. Mm -hmm. Um, with a gun, and mm -hmm. if he is very well aware that there are at least 20 other dudes in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and, and, you and, know, and, I'm just saying, I, that's what my heart is saying. Yeah, right. 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 I mean, I, I think then we've got to be willing to, it's going to be, and it's an arms race. It's like a Cold War arms race. Uh, in other words, oh, uh, it, it, you know, they, they, they get AKs, so now the cops have to get, you know, I don't know, rocket launchers, and then we can get rocket, like, it becomes, it becomes, I think, ridiculous and i think if you actually look at the data and actually have some good data on the second amendment and self-defense and, and just let me run through these because i think i think there's this narrative that's out there that says uh we're all sort of sitting ducks and we have to have these you know high capacity high high powered uh weapons in order to defend ourselves in, in fact uh, in 2017, the FBI reported that there were only 298 justifiable homicides involving a private citizen using a firearm. Okay, uh, that same year there were 10,380 criminal gun, gun homicides. In other words, guns were used in 35 criminal homicides for every justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide, self-defense. Now, the intended victims of violent crimes engaged in self-protective behavior that involved firearms in 1.1% of attempted and completed incidents in 2014 and 16. Intended victims of property crimes engaged in self-protective behavior that involved a firearm 0.3% of the attempted and completed incidents. So the point is, there isn't actually a lot of data to back up this idea that we've got to have these guns for self-defense, which is why I would argue that if we, if we instead of putting it in a self-defense bucket, which isn't really grounded in the reality of the world, all the problems, despite all the problems we're seeing in Burlington right now around uh, uh, violence and, and drugs, but the, but the reality of the world doesn't support an idea that we have, that this should be grounded in self-defense. Self-defense, firearms are very rarely used in self-defense. They're very often used for things like hunting, 
protecting your house uh, as a tool of agriculture, which is what I think most people, even in the 1790s, used them for. Um, and then I think that allows us to still protect that right. But you're, but you're forgetting no, something, but go ahead. No, no, I've, 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 I've said what I have to say. Chris, are you going to say something? Well, I mean, I, I love talking about data and statistics, yeah. but I think that yeah. when we start talking about politics and this often mm. political conversation, we always have to weigh um, the fact of reality versus perception. Mm -hmm. And perception is that kind of stuff. And yeah. my understanding from the interactions uh, anecdotally mm -hmm. with people over at LinkedIn, uh, I've had uh, more people in the last 12 months tell me that they purchased a gun mm -hmm. to defend themselves yeah. than I have had in the other 10, nine years I've lived here. Uh, so in um, yeah, perception is that people believe that this gun will keep them safe. Yeah. And no matter how much we talk about statistics, 129 cases, well, yeah. if you are, are 130 person, no doubt, you know, this is what's always on people's minds. So yeah. you always have to combat what, what the reality is, what the data says, with what we know people feel. Mm -hmm. Because um, in any argument, in any fight, any day, any one of us, um, you think logic and emotion, most people go with the emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's more about how they feel than what but, the logic's going to be. But I, yeah. well, I think that you both, in a way, are uh, forgetting something, and that is the historical context mm -hmm. of the Second Amendment. Right. It was not grounded necessarily only in self defense, although it was mm -hmm. also in self defense, mm -hmm. but it was people. Have the right, and I want to ask two questions about this. So, people have the right to bear arms in this country because it's perceived that the state mm -hmm. that they need to protect themselves against tyranny. Mm -hmm. That is the historical context. It is really not about self defense. Now, that no, might true. be a yeah. wrong perception. Mm -hmm. It's one, though, that frankly, yeah. that I think has to be kept because this is the United States of America. Right. There's, I don't think there's any other constitution in the world that allows the right to bear arms. And I might be wrong. I might be wrong yeah, about that. So. But I think it's, it's because of our revolutionary mm -hmm. tradition. Yeah. And you are not addressing that. I mean, well, no, I, I think you're wrong. You're absolutely right. I'm so glad you brought it up. I love the fact that you're not brought it up. Who's just on the other side? I am a gender. You're green. I'm also a gender. You're green. I'm also an independent. Yeah, so you don't know the Victoria yeah. Times, too. Yes. But, uh, these are things all the many things I love about you, Sandy. Uh, but no, you are absolutely right. But again, reality versus perception, we are basing this argument that it's against a tyrannical government. Uh, I guess what? Um, in defense of a tyrannical mm -hmm. government. Yes. Um, in an effort to, um, as a constitutional right. But the second that we mentioned that in space political climate, mm -hmm. selected hearing, the way it's perceived is that person from this time of Trump rallies and believes in QAnon. I'm a lot of, okay. I don't that. care what people yeah. believe. I've existed prior to Trump. I was, I'll tell you a personal story about how, why I came to defend the second amendment. Yeah. I was a high school teacher in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was during the civil rights movement, it was during it, the Vietnam War, and I was constantly critical of the government. Yet, I was a kind of a proponent, as most Democrats are, of gun control. Mm -hmm. And one of my students brought up, well, you, you, you criticize the government, you criticize the government because it's tyrannical, and then you don't reference, you don't realize that people have the right to bear arms against the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And that's where it originated. I went, bingo, it was, it was like a, a transformative moment. It, interestingly, that, so the, the, the New York uh, Pistol and Rifle Club case, uh, that went to the U.S. Supreme Court you know, just, just this past term. That that was actually, I was more concerned about that piece of it because what it did is it allowed for uh, this, you know, New York commission, this government body to decide who would get these permits and who wouldn't. And they could certainly do it in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, and, and so I think that was, a, that was a, that sort of equal protection piece was problematic. But here's the thing, because you're absolutely right. That principle... That it that that the Second Amendment was was Thanks. really meant to protect allow people to protect themselves from a tyrannical government in the 1790s England. Uh, right. So so, so right. during the Revolution, but I think the, the the difficulty then becomes, and you know maybe the answer is fine, but uh, even if we say okay, uh, pistols, handguns, ARs, AKs, you know.
None of that. You know how much money the U.S. government spends on the military? What, I mean, you see those F-35s fly, right? None of that is going to send us from the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And if we think that it is, it's not. But you're arguing a different point. Yeah, I'm totally it's different. It's a totally Why? different point because the government has all these guns. Everybody knows it. You want the government to be the only entity on Earth that has all the guns? Well, or do you yeah. want people to have also the right to have guns? And this is a unique right. You can't let the government have all the guns. If you're so against all these high pollutant weapons, yeah. I love the production of those weapons. Well, well fair enough. Fair but enough. do it. Don't, don't take away the right to bear arms from people. Yeah. I love the production. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I think, it, I think it doesn't really hold a lot of water to say, well, we've got to be able to have these guns. Water. It, it does hold water yeah. when you want an armed citizenry against tyranny. Mm -hmm. What you're arguing really is that the government will always have more guns than right. the people do. Right. In, not, in less, well, no, in less, we're willing to say there, and the Supreme Court actually said this, there is no right to have a carrier jet. But unless we're willing to say, I, I should be able to, I should, I should be able to, under the Second Amendment, have a carrier jet or an F-35 if I can afford it, then that would be, that would actually protect us from a theoretical government. My, my hunting rifle isn't going to do a darn thing. Yeah. It is a different argument. You won't reach out the gun so the yeah. government will always I like that. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. The government will always have to put, you know, there are, there are problems here. You're talking about an armed conflict against your own government, and you have to recognize this. Depending on the administration, who, who's the commander in chief? Are they just going to surrender to you know, like, the weapons like they should have been in Afghanistan? And then, guess what? Your citizenry has those and the F 35s that are on the base, so your citizenry gets it anyway. So, we jump the gun to the government always do. Um, let's talk about how gun laws historically speaking have been used as a form and a tool of oppression right. by minorities and, right. and, and a tool of ethnic cleansing. Let's talk about the dangerous side of that mm -hmm. track. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you a tell you a group that recognized that early and they changed my thinking too in the Black Panthers. Right. Remember that? Yeah. That was the Black Panther Party for mm -hmm. Self Defense. Yeah. Black people argued the right to bear arms. Yeah. And that was the Black Panthers. They knew that they were I'm gunned in a way by the government. They still argue that for self defense and for rights against the tyranny of the government, they needed to write their own. Guess what happened to them? Well, I'm afraid you know, when people say it's time to regulate, uh, they say, you're right, it's time to give for the government to issue an AR 15 to have No, I, I, that's, I, what I would argue, if you're so upset about the government having these high pollutant weapons, mm -hmm. I love the production of those weapons. Easy. A lot, and that would be constitutional. How would you not get them imported from outside the U.S.? Just a oh, lot well. of the importation. Yeah, I mean, I think we can get we're, we're we're straying a bit from the from the fundamental sort of Second Amendment case, yeah, here. but but I but I well okay, I mean, you're still making them yourself, right? If you give them out, well, I guess where do you stop? Where do you? How far do you let the government go? Like they only have blunderbusses and uh, well, muskets, think, like in 1791. I would rather go there. Yeah. than to prohibit citizens' rights yeah. to bear arms. Let's say that the government doesn't have the right to bear those kinds of arms. Yeah. Why not? I mean, you wouldn't have any dispute for me on that. Well, yeah, <laughs> and then and then we then we avoid that then we avoid the arms race uh, well, yes. where we all have to get you know. Well, yes. Cannon sales will certainly shoot up on Amazon overnight for sure. <laughs> Yeah. But you know, like the whole thing about nukes. Why do we allow the government of the United mm. States to have and employ nukes? Why right. just outlaw them? Yeah. Which will never happen, of course. I mean, I think this, the thing about the Second Amendment that's so hard in a lot of ways is okay. it's, well, no, it's hard, I'm saying, for us to like grapple with is I feel like it's become, it's like it's a partisan thing. And neither side can acknowledge any legitimacy in the other side's perspective and, and i think it's i think it's true uh, and so you and so as a result you can never sort of come to any sort of resolution around it right neither both both sides say well 
you know, one side says, well, if you, if you regulate anything, you know, we're, we're, it's going to be tyranny of the government. The other side no, says, no. well, we can't, we can't let people have guns because, you know, then it's going to be, you know, anarchy or whatever. Neither side really actually has a conversation about it. And neither side, neither side, neither side can, can recognize the, I'm not talking about us, right? We're, we're all, you know, colleagues, but neither side oh. at large can, uh, can acknowledge any validity in the other side. The I second I'm, not, I'm not saying you. And I'm saying there's a solution, okay. which nobody will go to, yeah. nobody, because it's mm. capitalism. Yeah. That's really why. How about the production of these stupid weapons? Right. Why isn't that a solution which would be constitutional? Right. right. Well, that would certainly deal with the tyranny of the government. Yes. Yeah. You know. So therefore, I don't get it. I don't get why it's the citizens who have to pay the price of this argument. Right. Why doesn't the government have to disarm? I think it should. It could. But it doesn't. Right. Because it wants a monopoly on weapons. Right. Doesn't it? Certainly. I mean, we spend a lot I mean, of money. I mean, on the, 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 uh, the people who want to control guns mm -hmm. are being accused of something even more severe, and that is they want to confiscate guns. Right. right? Isn't that a correct thought? Confiscate guns from citizens? Right. What does that mean? Going into their houses, searching their houses, finding those guns, right. and taking them yeah. away? And how can you be so naive to think that that's going to not result in unintended conflict? I think, yeah. it's, I think it's part, that's what you're talking yeah. about. That's become partisan. What type of guns are you talking about banning the production of? Because I'm no, a sure. No. Yeah, okay, I'm down, I'm cool. Like, I'm, I don't I don't even fall in my wagons or anything like that down the street. But I'm like, just kind of curious because a lot of talk is centered around the ER-15. I mean, look at, look at, I do not believe in war, for instance, mm -hmm. at all. I don't believe in the government using their weapons to attack people on other continents and kill civilians. Why don't we, why don't we discuss gun control from the military? Mm. Why don't we get drone okay. control? I, I mean it. Yeah. If we're serious about right. killing people, if we're serious about killing civilians, why doesn't the argument pay? Why is there no argument that the government should not be armed either to do that kind of stuff? Why? Yeah. I, mean, I don't I, get it because it's all the argument about the Second Amendment is constantly focused mm -hmm. on making citizens deprived of their rights to bear arms. That's the whole argument. Right. I don't get it. Do you? Well, I, I think I think it's. Be, I mean, I don't know what it was like in 1791. Whether it was, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't <laughs> we're coming out of a revolution. No, I'm saying I don't know. I don't know if it was considered a partisan. Issue that well, it, was a, it was considered a necessary right. right to defend against tyranny, and it was. What, what I'm saying is now the reason we have these same conversations, I think this is my view, over and over again, and never seem to get anywhere, is because we, everybody sort of backed into their own corners, and 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 you know the left refuses to acknowledge that there's validity to. Have needing yeah. firearms in order to defend ourselves from tyrannical government and from no, and, from, and to protect. No, I, I think I think well, I think generally they fall in, they fall back and say no that that's that's BS that's fantasy yeah, land. Okay, do. and then on the right they say well all you really want to do is take all our guns away and you know it's 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 it's, it's oppression and I think neither are right but both back into those corners and can never acknowledge each other any validity each other's arguments and so as a result we have these same conversations of society year after year and and nothing ha nothing changes maybe people in general want to have the right to bear arms and yeah, why of it course. doesn't change that's why it doesn't change yeah <laughs> it well, seems to me there's, there's a lot of um you're right we are polarized yeah but, no, we're not. Well, we're in camps, in my opinion. But as far as I'm concerned, being on the right, I know many gun owners who know everything about mm -hmm. guns from top mm -hmm. to bottom. And then I know I've had conversations with people on the left that they are very pro gun control, but they don't know, and they make it known that they're so ignorant, they know nothing when they're talking about guns. So they're very little, it's all emotion. Mm -hmm. And both camps are feeding from emotional points. The right is very based in logic because they understand every component of that firearm. 
Um, I don't, first of all, well, I do not. I just have to be able to communicate because one side refuses to understand if the left wants to really engage in this, they need to do their homework and understand what firearms they're talking about. Mm -hmm. You sound really foolish when you're talking about an AR-15 being a fully armed. Look, at, I don't think that's the discussion, discussion on either the left or the right. I do not believe that's the cause of polarization. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I think is the cause of polarization. People do not understand the history of this country. Mm -hmm. They do not understand the nature of our revolution which was fought with arms against the strongest empire on earth, and we won. Mm -hmm. And those Americans, the founders knew that we had to have the right to bear arms against tyranny. And in, in the Second Amendment, that's why I had Jared here tonight, what needs to be put in the historical perspective of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are so strongly in favor of the Second Amendment. And once I think that people understand our history, the unique history of this republic, they change their minds. They might still allow regulation of certain guns, mm -hmm. but that regulation should pertain to both the government and citizens, it appears to me. You cannot let the state have all the guns and the people mm -hmm. have none. That will never happen in the United States of America, never. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's crazy. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Right. Well, they, are, they have all the power. They have, and they want it. Sure. All governments, not just our yeah, government, all, government. all governments, all states want all the power and all the guns. And I want to ask that question again. What other constitution well, in the world allows the right to bear arms on the part of citizens? That's the first thing a police state does, mm -hmm. is to take away citizens' guns. The very first thing it does. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Because then you can commit atrocities and you can force your people to do whatever you want. Exactly. And it's, I think, I'm not right or left, by the way. Mm. Neither. I'm very pro left in some regards and very pro right on other regards. But I'll tell you one thing I am for the history of this republic mm. and I'm for keeping it a free republic. And I think every citizen of this country should be equally committed to that. Because we've lost the best part of all of our traditions, it seems to me. But anyway, so that's yeah. my rant, I guess. I don't know if there's anybody on the, on the computer wants to chime in. Guess not. Anyway, what? Okay. Anyway, I don't know if it's we're... It's always fine. Over or not? What do you think? Over, over, or over? I don't know, but I don't have the time. I'll catch that. 638. Yeah. 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 Okay, so anybody else have any thoughts? Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the it's interesting um, that the Supreme Court didn't end up deciding when the, the New York case because it wasn't. Okay. Talk a little bit more about that New York case. Well, so the the basic gist of it is New York had a permitting process for concealed carry um, that made it that made it. You, yes, but it was very, very, apparently it was very, very difficult in order to get a concealed carry permit, I believe. Uh, and there was concerns. And in fact, uh, to, to, to the point you made a little a little while ago about Black Panthers, there was a, a, an organization, uh, an African-American organization, I forget which one, but it filed an amicus brief uh, against the state of New York on the grounds that this law could be applied in a discriminatory fashion. So that, yeah. Black people wouldn't be able to get guns, and white people would be able to get guns, or this side would be able to get guns, and that side wouldn't be able to get guns. Which, truthfully to me, was a very problematic part of the law because anytime you start doling out any right based on someone's ethnicity, but how would they do that exactly? Well, uh, like, I mean, well, for example, if um, you know they base it on some sort of uh, underlying criminal history, oh, okay. uh, you know, the same way that you know. People get pulled over for the broken taillight. Uh, people talk about driving while black, mm -hmm. right? There's all sorts of ways that the government come up with, way, with ways to discriminate against a particular set of people if it wants to. Um, and so there are real concerns about would this be applied neutrally? We don't know the answer to that because the, the, the law is no longer on the books. But I think that's a real concern. And I think that goes to your point as to why organizations like the Black Panthers supported the Second Amendment 
uh, because of the history of oppression against black people in the United States. Um, you'll have no disputes from, from me on that point. Uh, and I think that would be concerning with the U.S. Supreme Court. I hope it would be concerning with the U.S. Supreme Court as well. We don't, we don't know if the court didn't decide the case. Um, but I think we'll likely see challenges to similar laws um, because clearly there's, there's an appetite in certain states to see how far they can push uh, the regulation of firearms. Mm -hmm. And where we're left is the, primarily the, the, the case law that comes out of the Heller decision, which doesn't answer those questions. But the Heller decision, the Heller decision clearly stated that citizens have the right. It's an, it's an individual right. Uh, and it, that longstanding history and tradition is uh, really, really important to the analysis. And they look at that history of, of, of government oppression, of tyranny, of, of the revolution, uh, as well as the grammatical workings of the statute or the amendment itself um, to reach that conclusion that it isn't about being part of a militia. You don't have to be right. part of a militia, that you, I, we have this as an individual right. Uh, that is very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't see that changing mm -hmm. uh, uh, under this court or any future court. Uh, what, I, what I think would be interesting to see in the future is what do they do with the regulation of guns in certain sensitive places? What do they do with limits on the type of firearms, uh, the type of magazines, um, are do those fall within this tradition and history of regulation of firearms or not? Mm -hmm. If they don't, under Heller, the laws can't stand. Mm -hmm. um, right? If there isn't some history and tradition of this sort of regulation, the law can't stand. So that's what the court will be looking at when, when, and if we, if and when we see, um, you know, other challenges. Uh, okay, Chris, do you have anything? Well, I mean, you did kind of bring up a point that I was just looking up. But I'm kind of curious, reading in the newspaper a lot in Vermont, when we have gun reform laws and across the nation, talking about a magazine capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so this seems to be uh, a front of attack where that is we're going to be seeing approach mm -hmm. of it for what are both of your opinions on magazine capacity location and what do you think the court's going to do and why? What avenue do you think they would take to in their um, Decision. Yeah, I mean, I think the court's going to look at, you know, and it's hard to say exactly, you know, what, you know, are we talking about a certain, you know, number of rounds, you know, what, 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 what is the context of the regulation? What's the purpose of the law? And I think what the court is going to do, because of what it said in Heller, is going to say, is there a history and tradition of this sort of regulation? Uh, and if there's not, the law isn't going to stand up to constitutional muster. Um, uh, that's sort of the analysis that we're going through. My critique of the history and tradition test, uh, and why I would take a much more sort of objective sort of First Amendment approach, there are categories of firearms that are, are protected versus the history and tradition test, is because it's really easy to say, well, the history and tradition test is objective. Like, everybody agrees as to what the history was. I don't think it's quite as simple as that. Uh, you know, and I point to there's actually a great clip from I don't know if you've seen Tombstone from the best movies ever, where I'm Sam sorry, Elliott. No, uh, there might have been a Clint Eastwood version, but there's mm -hmm. a clip of Sam Elliott uh, when the you know the, the bad guys roll into uh, into Tombstone. Tombstone, and then he points to a sign that said like check your check your firearms at the, at at the at city limits. Those were real laws that really existed. So if I point to that history and tradition then you end up with one version of gun regulation versus if I point to the history and tradition of, uh, you know, defending ourselves against England, yeah, then you end up with a different. So I think that, I guess I'm just pointing out, that's my, that's my critique of a history and tradition analysis for deciding whether something's constitutional or not, because it's really easy to pick whatever history tradition you want Wait to get to the outcome you want. Wait a minute, you're talking about Tombstone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're talking about a town outline. Yeah. Okay, that's like local democracy. That's not like the federal government issuing orders to confiscate your weapons. No, fa fair enough. But okay. what the, that's totally fair. But what the what the court has done it has it has looked at outside of the context of just mm -hmm. what the federal government has done, right? It talked about like here here's what New York had done historically. Here's what you know different states had mm -hmm. done historically. Um, 
So of course, maybe that's not a perfect example, no, but I think that's the, I think that's a that, I think it's a valid example, maybe not a perfect example, but I think that's the risk of always just saying, well, the objective way it is is history and tradition. Okay, but it is something you start with the text, and yes, you think about things like history and tradition, but that can't be the talisman. It's so easy to cherry pick the history I want to get to the outcome. I, I want history. This I'm person wants to get to the outcome. Not so I'm not saying you. I'm saying that's the problem with the history and tradition test, in my view. But, but, but those have to be equals. Yeah. If the federal government takes away your guns or regulates your mm -hmm. guns, it's different than mm -hmm. a local city, which is not particularly armed itself. Mm -hmm. right? I bet you Tombstone didn't have any organized government that was full of weapons. My air had a pretty cool gun. But he was on the air. <laughs> right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that, I mean, so you were mm -hmm. mixing, I think, apples and oranges. Between the federal government with all the weapons versus a city or a town like two, uh, two stars yeah. without any organized government possession of weapons, mm -hmm. allowing that I'm also yeah. Versus. No, I think that's fair. I wasn't thinking of it in the context of what the government have had didn't yeah. have certainly if you look at it that way. Yes. yes, I was just pointing out that like the problem with a history and tradition test, which is like basically what the court has for deciding whether regulation yes. is okay or not, is that you can sort of pick and choose the history you like. Of course, uh, of course, and of course as opposed to just reading what it says on paper, the words, the text, um, uh, in, a, in sort of in doing it from a, a more objective standpoint. I have a different question. Why do you suppose? In the end, there's no such thing as objectivity. The courts pretend something's an objective decision, right? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think want it's really true. But, yeah. Citizens yeah. should be objective, don't you think? Sure. Right? Yeah. Okay, so why? You're gonna ask an interesting question. What? You were about to ask no, an interesting I don't question. Know if it was I'm just saying. I don't know that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, why has this issue yeah. become so partisan? Mm -hmm. I'm, I really believe this. I am not partisan. I'm right. not a Republican. Right. Why that I mean party yeah. divisions? Why has this become such a polarized partisan issue where the Republicans mm. um, are arguing for the right to bear arms and the Democrats find themselves does that mean that the Democratic population trusts the government more than the okay. Republicans? Is that what's yeah. the deal? You're a Republican. Yeah. Why has this become, uh, rather than a citizen's issue, mm. a partisan's issue? Because we both raise the bottom line. Mm. Oh. We raise money to the bad guys, and they and you raise are, money you are to the So you are also speaking as a representative. I'm, I'm speaking from parties. Like from and parties. you are a Republican. I am a Republican. Okay. Mm, I have. Which is very rare. We both you know, raise like, money on We both we have talking points. When we start talking about these, there are, we all know there are five subjects that we start talking about, the money starts coming in. And so follow the money. Yeah. So there you go. We get money out of politics. I don't. And, and no, well, we get money out of politics, and then we avoid that okay, problem. Maybe people what? can then actually. So you, you know, capitalize on certain communities mm -hmm. giving you money because because of guns. Is that right? I'm saying that the polarization um, is profitable. Has been becoming entrenched is very profitable, yeah. and on you both sides, on side. both sides, you totally. have many people that are Democrats that raise money on fighting for a more mm -hmm. regulation and. Yeah, let's not forget it's not just the candidates and for the politicians. There are packs and big money behind this. There are jobs, there are trips, there are junkets. There's, there's, yeah, it's big money. So the Republicans then are libertarian because libertarians give money to the Republican Party. To the libertarians, well, some do. Um, but and they've got it to give, I suppose, right? I mean, yeah. that. Yeah. I think I think you're I think you're right. Like follow the money, and you'll find out a lot of times why there's divisions in the country. And I think there's real real truth to that. The other thing I, I would just add is, you know, the the polarization of it might actually be entirely tribal. And wow. and, and it, in other words, people. I think the, my critique of parties, and this is I'm getting to talk about the First Amendment now, which I would set the outset. That's my thing. I think the, 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 one of the problems with parties is they, they're a shortcut and they allow us to sort of other people say, well, you're not on my team, so I've got to disagree with you, even if maybe there's certain things that you're saying that make sense. And that's what I, I keep going back to, and maybe you guys aren't buying it, maybe you are, I don't know. But I keep going back to this idea of like people just back into their corners and don't even acknowledge, you know what? 
you know, there's actually some sense to what you're saying. Uh, when it comes to, you know, self-defense or, you know, there's actually some sense to what you're saying. You know, like maybe there are too many guns on the street, uh, uh, it, having those sorts of conversations. And I think parties and partisanship make that worse because we just do, we do it as a shortcut and say, you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, or I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat. We must disagree. So you're, I think you're on something here. Parties elevate personalities yeah. and some personalities are, or have been viewed as repellent. Yeah. Um, like what? I will not say their names <laughs> on recording, but some names are very repellent. And um, when that's why people automatically back up, they won't lean in and say, well, you know, X, Y, or Z actually has a few good points here. Maybe, no, it's the repellent. Oh. And I experience personally, you know, people, some people are like, him? I'm doing the opposite. And, Why? Because and, you're a Republican or because of other uh, because, because, because of everything. Yeah, right, I get it. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that people, I mean, people, I think, would, nor, would naturally disagree, but I think it's a lot harder to say, well, I'm just not going to listen to that person if you think about them as another human being as, a part, as opposed to, like, a party. Uh, you're right, you know, know that, that I'm not going to listen to her kid because they're mean. Right. Like that defiant nature is very childish, right? Yeah. We see it in manifest in young children. Yeah. And when in modern politics, we actually see it happening in a lot of adults too. I, I want to talk one last topic. The Democrats, I won't say that, people on the left have repeatedly argued uh, against quote, gun violence. That is a piece of propaganda. Mm -hmm. oh, it is, yeah. Because I always ask the question, guns do not cause violence. Mm -hmm. People cause violence. Now, why aren't the Republicans more hit to that? You know, you can have a gun and you're not violent. Mm -hmm. which, I've got six. Well, we don't know about you, though. <laughs> right? They're, they're under lock and key, and I don't know where the key is. Violence. They're under lock and key, and I don't know where the key is. I'm not sure how to put it on the key. I mean, I know it's not. Yet. That's I should have said that. No, <laughs> not on the air. Are you sure? I do know where a key is. Oh, I do know where a key is. Well, I, I, Wait a minute. Yeah, so keep finishing your thoughts. Yeah. So there is a perception, including what you've said tonight, mm -hmm. among Americans that guns cause violence. What the hell? Well, that's because there's a perception in modern America that people can't be bad. It has to be this. Are you kidding? Oh, are you serious? And how do we see a pullback on consequences for people who, and who people for behavior and their poor action? Or do we see a constant pattern of trying to excuse it and blame the drug no. or this or no. something else? I think that the, I think politics are often, wars are often decided on the perception that certain leaders are bad rather than what the causes of the war are. Mm. We define the world, Americans, in terms of good and bad. Mm. I think that's a real bad mistake. Yes. I mean, I think people who use guns, people who use guns are the violent people. It's not gun violence, it's, it's people violence. Mm. And I don't understand why, why the citizens are hip to that. Why aren't they? I hear that. Wait a minute. Well, I don't hear it very well. It is something that needs to be said. The possession of a gun does not cause violence. Mm -hmm. It's a person that does that, and they in fact have committed a crime for which they should go to jail, maybe forever. Right. But it's not the it's not the possession of guns that are making violence. And that's what the, you know, even your argument is that. No, that, I, that I, I, I think you're right. That is because we have all these guns that, um, that crime is so high. No, it's not because we have guns, it's because we have violent people amongst us. And what are we going to do about that? Exactly. Mm. I'm asking a serious yeah. question. Well, I, I don't, I think, if I, I didn't, I don't want to represent that. Uh, I disagree with the fact that, of course, right, bad people kill uh, people, yes, exactly. right? Uh, 100%. And, they kill them, and they kill them overseas, too. 100%, 100%. But it's not bad. I mean, we would never say our soldiers are bad people. They're ordered to do it by yeah. our government. But, but, but I don't understand this idea that it's the, it's the possess, it's, 
a, a thing that causes violence rather than it's penal. So what is your answer to that? Why has that been such a compelling argument even? I mean, I think we have I think we have a violent culture. I do too. Uh, and and I mean, you know, when you have a violent culture, you're gonna have violent things happen. And I think it's getting more violent. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they're, they're less. well, it is getting more violent at times, but there tends to be an ebb and flow with these things. But um, and no, it's, I mean, it's increasing, it's increasing, increasing, and increasing in intensity and frequency, mm. uh, which is alarming. I think that it's alarming. It's destroying our civilization. Yeah. But it's not the possession it's of the gun. It's the, the people. Why are we producing so many violent people? Mm. Well, that is mainly, a big mainly, question. I hate to say this, mainly, and I hate to say this, I honestly do, but mainly young men. Why? Why have the, and maybe, and I think if you would look at the good gun shootings, there are young women. Well, you know. No, no wait a minute, is that correct or not? Is that correct or not? I don't know the statistics of young women. If you look, if you look at the school shootings, the school shootings. Yep, yep. I think that there is a classical conditioning element to this. We are inundated and awash in digital media nonstop. And I don't mean social media. The media that we consume for entertainment, TV and movies, Bill Maher just did a hot take on this a few weeks ago. All these movies are about the Avengers, the Revengers, the I'm using a gun to like take and revenge. It is all you get from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But you always get absorbing. Right. And now for the last, but always no, because we haven't had movies, especially pro super graphic movies like this for much more than 40 to 56 years. And I don't need to sound like super poor here. But I'm just saying there is a <laughs> kind of conversation that we have to do it. Well, because she was all about the censorship of and um grant that thought of being fire and uh, perpetuating violence. Um, but I'm getting at this, this is if we're constantly being covered with negativity mm -hmm. and with these negative reinforcements, that is a contributing factor. How do we weigh these contributing factors? Okay, so maybe, maybe. Uh, I, yeah. I, I I think something else, but anyway, what No, I, I think I think that's fair, and I and I think uh, I don't I know we're talking the second amendment and I keep coming back to the first, but I think I think one of the problems you have to tell on the media, right? No, definitely not. Okay. Uh, 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 I want you to be able to control the media. No. Well, I think one of the problems is we all have this perspective that like we have the First Amendment freedom of speech and we're darn right. That's why we can sit here and debate this and the government can't come in with its guns blazing not and we're not allowed not to talk yet. about not that yet. anymore. Uh, and that's and that's that's terrific. But I think one of the problems that we're, we're facing right now is everybody wants to scream on the left, on the right, in the middle. I got this freedom of speech. I'm screaming at you about something. And we, we for, <laughs> fine, no, but I know, but I think here's the, here's the thing. I, I, I think I think we, we forget that with the constitutional right also comes a responsibility. And I think with the First Amendment, the right is to speak. The responsibility is to be willing to listen to each other. And I think you listen. I course yeah, so I, I think I, so. I, absolutely. So, so thank you for that. Um, so, my, so my, my my point is, I think if, if we don't recognize that with this freedom of speech to to, to just yell and scream comes the responsibility to listen and practice a little bit of empathy with each other. This keeps coming back to my theme that like all the on the Second Amendment, we we should be we can argue, we can debate, and we can disagree. We should. That's what makes it interesting. But we should we shouldn't hate each other. A lot of people, I, I, I know, I'm not making it a person. I think we, the royal we, the, the writ large we, uh, the, the inter party warfare, the hate for the other side, right? You don't think that exists in American politics right now? I don't. I'm not terrifically concerned about it. I am. I am. My concern is an overarmed government. And I'll tell you something that I really feel mm. if young men were not trained for war, Mm. You might have a lot less violence. Mm. They, if you think about any of you as a young boy, weren't you trying to go to war and kill other people? Where you were not. I know that Grant was, I'm going to hate to put you on the spot, but we grew up in the Vietnam War. It was challenging. Well, it was every every boy. Right, the glorification of it. No, no, we're, no, we're not the glorification, the training that you are going to. What? Yes, you are going to go into war and kill. How much are you required to take Rossi? 
Yeah. And what does that mean? Okay. Can I say one last thing? And Sandy's going to close out. I think this has been a really fun and interesting conversation. I think we had. And you don't hate it. No, of course not. We started out with you know a little bit on the Second Amendment and, and the, the law and the cases. But I think we had a really interesting back and forth uh, conversation. And I, this is what's terrific about what Vicky does, honestly. Um, and so I'm excited to have been able to be part of the first one. I look forward to seeing the others and doing more. Because we've got to be able to do this and, and afterward, you know, still smile and, 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 you know, all enjoy each other's company. And I'll leave it at that. We'll never give up having a good time together. All right? Okay. Thank you all for being here. And this is again going to be recorded on CCTV and played again. Thank you. See you next week.